Hello everyone, Alan here again, and we're ready to continue our series on the freedom for the body of Christ and the 12 precious stones of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, and how, the, how they relate toward this incredible rescue operation that God's going to be doing for his people in the very near future, right over the horizon actually. And we've been using these 12 precious stones to give us insight into what the nature of this incredible liberation is going to be like. And in the process, we've also learned something about, up to this point, the first two precious stones, which are Jasper and Sapphire, and how submission to the Lord's will in the heart would lead to a situation where in the case of individual believers, they would be refined and polished and become desirable in God's eyes like a jasper stone. And then with the sapphire, would it would cause the body of Christ to be almost just like a sapphire in that they would achieve a diversity of shades of a single color, the glorification of Christ. And both of them just remarkable pictures. And today we're looking at the third of these precious stones, which is chalcedony. Now, the, uh, regarding uh, chalcedony, it's actually a whole broad range of different quartz minerals. It's not really a specific type per se, but it it actually covers quite a, just a number of different types, such as agate and sardonyx and chrysoprase and even petrified wood. But what they what these all share as in terms of qualifying to be uh, classified as chalcedony is, is that there are quartz in, in terms of composition and also they are of a certain type of structure. Like the official word is a microcrystalline structure as opposed to something granular uh, in structure as opposed to something more fibrous in nature. So uh, with that said, it, it turns out that when when, when you're looking at why chalcedony is, is mentioned as one of these 12 precious stones, it, you need to bring up, you need to realize that the way in which it's formed is, is quite interesting. It, it turns out that, it, well, actually there's a, a variety of different scenarios at, or such different examples of how it might form. Uh, one, one example is that of, a, well, I, I don't know exactly the formation process, but for, for you might be familiar with the geode, which is almost looks like a coconut, and it, basically when you break this rock open, it the interior lining of that rock is has all these beautiful uh, crystal cr crystals, uh, almost just like breaking open a coconut. You would look at the white lining and, and inside the coconut. It's, it's quite quite interesting, and, and then of course uh, there are other examples, but in, in another situation would be one where you have ground waters or uh, waters beneath the Earth's surface who, that uh, reach a situation where because of their high silica content and then going through a situation where the temperatures are cool and approach cooling temperatures near, near, on the level of say the, the Earth's crust then these it goes through a, a solidifying or depositing process and as a result, the, the, the nature or the structure or, the, or even the appearance of this, of, of, these, uh, of this now solid mineral it is very different than it was when it first started. And winds up it, many times just achieving a very, very beautiful appearance, yeah, quite, quite, quite desirable. So it, not necessarily so precious in terms of appearance but not necessarily in terms of rarity, because as I've said, there's um, there, some of these precious stones are actually not necessarily all that rare, but but they still are very desirable or unique in their own various ways. So, at any rate, so that's that's then, well, may, maybe you can guess what we're trying to drive at here then, as far as Chalcedony is concerned, that it pictures the transformation into something superior. It shows us that as believers, we're we're, we're, the Lord wants us to, to wind up being transformed, to become more Christ-like. And in the case of Jasper, it was more of a refining and getting polished and 
going through a costly discipline process, so to speak. But with Calcetini, it's, it's somewhat more general in that we're trying to point out that the Calcetini is trying to show us that it's the Lord's will for us, us to be transformed into something just superior to our original state. And, and it's, so it's actually a relatively simple message. And the application is that believers are, by necessity, supposed by following the Lord, are supposed to be transformed into something far more excellent. So at this point, I'd like to bring in a passage that relates to all this, and this is Romans 4, 7 through 15. And it talks about how Abraham, Abraham's faith was, was of, a, of, a, of a level that enabled him to become the father of both those who call themselves circumcised as well as uncircumcised uh, Jews and Gentiles. Or, and how that faith in his heart was so valuable in God's eyes that it was, quote, even more, uh, it was superior to anything that had been uh, witnessed up to that point as far as uh, people, as far as related to God uh, was concerned. So anyway, I would like to give you uh, a few, the option of pausing this video if you'd like to take a look at that passage, and we will pick up in just a bit. So welcome back. So we're, we are looking at the Chalcedony and why, and why, why it's a picture of, uh, and, and a picture of the transformation of God's people into something uh, superior. And it turns out that in, in the case of this passage that I just referred to you with uh, Romans 4, Abraham's faith was enabled or qualified him to be the father of the Gentiles as well as the people of Israel. Of course, he was an Israelite by background, so he he was qualified to represent them because he, the circumcision was mandated for all, uh, all people of of Israel. This was toward the, actually the end of Abraham's life when he was 99 uh, that this institution was given. But, and, the, and also of Israelites who had who had faith to follow God they, of the heart, which uh, faith is a, is a heart or a trust thing in God. But but Abraham uh, was also qualified to be the father of Gentiles too, like me and maybe you, uh, who are not circumcised in the flesh, but uh, of but who have faith to follow God in the heart. And in the end, that's what circumcision is about. It's about uh, appealing a, a way of the flesh to be. Uh, to be consecrated to God, to be dedicated to God in the heart. And so, e even though, uh, Ab if you're looking in terms of ch chronologically speaking, uh, Abraham's f faith came before uh, the, the the circumcision uh, mandate when, when he toward, which was actually one year, I believe, before Isaac, the promised son, finally came to him. So that was toward the end of this incredibly long waiting process that he went through. But but it does but put put aside that, that time factor. If you look in, in general what it's trying to show us, it's trying to show us that something physical, which circumcision is, when you come right down to it, has been replaced with something superior, which is something spiritual, which is faith. faith uh, trust. Some, some faith, faith in God is trusting God. It's relating to God through the heart, personally, and trusting Him, just believing that he, he has the wisdom and desires the best for us, and we desire the best for His kingdom as well. And so that's, that's a, you might say, in the general sense, a replacement of something with something far superior in terms of how we relate to God. One is through a physical institution, and one, and now we're, it, it's, it's more of just a, a heart relationship. So it's it's a it's an interesting way. It's a it's a superior way of relating to God uh, than the physical sign of just identifying with a certain people or group, you might say. Now, so then regarding the body of Christ, then why is it then that, what what is holding us back from being transformed into something superior? And if you really come right down to it, the one of the main factors that 
is hindering us is that of the heart. We we just as as a body don't, of believers don't have the heart to follow God. The hearts if the heart's not there, how's the if the desire isn't there, how are we going to be able to submit ourselves to the Lord and just follow Him where He wants to lead us and through everything that the Bible speaks about in terms of changing the world for Him? And but it turns out that's something the Lord wants to will address, is going to take care of in this uh, massive liberation process that's coming on behalf of His people. He will be dealing with this this heart transplant necessity. <laughs> our needs to get our heart transplant uh, that in order to do his will uh, the Bible speaks of that in Jeremiah and Ezekiel among other places another factor that's holding back the body of Christ is that of insufficient truth and I'm talking about knowledge I'm talking about I'm talking about just biblical knowledge about what's required to follow God and in today's churches unfortunately if you really consider how much of the Word of God is really being taught in today's churches, it tends to be a small fraction of it actually, and, and just a very select portion that it doesn't really quite measure up in terms of giving us all the tools and, and resources and, and knowledge that we need to live victorious lives for God. So that's a huge factor as well, and one that needs to be borne in mind. And the third one that I'm going to mention right now is that of financial resources. And if you really come look and evaluate things, it becomes quite clear when you look at the world around you that the amount of financial resources in the community of unbelievers is much greater than that for uh, believers. Uh, and even the financial finances that the believers do have is not necessarily being deployed very effectively or efficiently to do the Lord's work anyway. Some of it isn't being used at all. That which does get used, it doesn't necessarily wind up getting uh, put in places where you get get a big bang for the buck as far as doing the Lord's will. So, so those are some of the then some of the issues that are at stake here, and we will, in the future studies to come, explore more about uh, about the precious stones and what they have to say, and you know, giving us insight into God's intent his will for us as a body of believers overall so i hope this has been helpful to you and we'll move on to the emerald as the fourth precious stone in our next study so until then stay tuned and uh, god bless you